Good afternoon, my name is Benjamin Baird and I'm your host today as part of the Middle East Forum's webinar series featuring topical discussions moderated by our project directors. I am the Deputy Director of Islamist Watch and the head of Islamism in Politics, the forum's effort to counter Islamist political organizing in local, state, and federal government. And that is why I'm such a fan and admirer of our guest today, Mr. Daniel Greenfield, who has been covering the issue of Islamist intrusion into American politics for some time now as a Shillman Journalism Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Mr. Greenfield covers the issue as meticulously as any investigative journalist in the US, from pointing out Islamist fundraising in the Biden campaign to exposing shocking government partnerships with Islamic extremists. His pamphlet, The Great Betrayal, documents the disastrous true histories of Obama's wars from Afghanistan and Iraq to Libya. Thank you, Daniel, for being with us today. It's very much my pleasure, and it's an honor to be asked to speak to you about the subject. It is a serious issue, one that in many ways um, we've neglected in our current politics because everybody has a limited attention span, and there's only so many things that we can pay attention to, which is natural, it's human. Uh, but the interesting thing about this issue is uh, the extent to which it's ballooned, to which it's become a big crisis while we were paying attention to other things. Now, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, for example, with the Ground Zero Mosque debate, with the debate over NYPD surveillance of terror mosques in an attempt to stop terrorist attacks. Um, these are two key issues. There were uh, lower uh, profile issues, such as the Khalil Gibran Academy, a public school that was designed around um, various Islamist agendas. Now, these uh, were the key pitched battles in New York City, and you know, time passed, we forgot, we moved on, uh, we're in a new decade entirely. Yet since then, the key players on the Islamist side in those battles uh, have become very entrenched in the political power structure in New York City. Uh, they played key roles in the de Blasio administration. Uh, they played key roles in the um, radical, increasingly radical New York City Council. And now they're set to play significant roles in the um, Eric Adams administration. Now, one important thing to remember is that Eric Adams was formerly the borough president of Brooklyn. Um, when people think about the Islamist concentration in America, they think about Dearborn, they think about various uh, towns and cities, for example, in Michigan, yet Brooklyn has an estimated a quarter to a fifth of the uh, Muslim population in America. It uh, has arguably one of the largest concentration of mosques in America, but because it's so big and it's so dense, we don't think of it in the same way as having this large Islamist concentration, yet it does. Uh, the secret to Eric Adams' success in politics was that uh, he built a very diverse coalition in the more traditional sense. Uh, while his opponents um, were more progressive, uh, they focused very much on an electorate that was uh, more overwhelmingly white and prosperous. Eric Adams built a very successful coalition that was very multicultural of various groups. Among them, he engaged in very targeted outreach as we're going to discuss to, for example, the Turkish community and various other groups, including in general, the various Muslim Brotherhood fronts in America. Uh, right. this is and uh, Mr. Greenfield, before we get too deeply into the discussion of uh, Mr. Eric Adams' transition team and partnerships with Islamists, um, I do wanna remind our viewers that the first 20 minutes of our webinar today will be a discussion between Mr. Greenfield and myself. The final 10 minutes, they have the opportunity to ask questions themselves, which Mr. Dan, Mr. Greenfield will answer for them. Um, you can do that by leaving your questions in the Q&A box uh, below. I do apologize in advance if we don't get to them all, but we will certainly try to. Um, so Mr. Greenfield, you started to mention uh, Eric Adams' Uh, new administration and how he's sort of been viewed somewhat as a, a centrist as a Democrat, not not so much as a, uh, an AOC, for instance. Um, that's kind of surprising. He used to be an NYPD captain, for instance, not someone you would expect him to be hanging out with the Islamists, correct? That's somewhat complicated. So Eric Adams has gone undergone multiple transitions and transformations. He was mm -hmm. once a fan of Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, I would just uh, remind him, sure, most people understand that uh, the Nation of Islam is not what we think of in terms of traditional Sunni or Shiite Islam. It is very much its own cult with its own variant beliefs. Uh, but what we're actually seeing with some of his appointments, which we're going to discuss later, uh, they do come out of the Black Muslim community. So um, he's built this kind of 
political network, and he has a past where he has been an extremist and where he's been a moderate, and he kind of goes back and forth. And I think he's not one thing or another, but he is very politically savvy. He's very good at building these relationships. The extent to which he has any commitment to these relationships may be open to question, uh, but there's certainly things in this past you can look at and go, uh, he was indeed uh, associated with extremists. Mm. So it was just in December that he announced this transition team, which includes some 800 individuals, which is, says a lot about government bureaucracy uh, and waste. Um, many of them happen to be Islamists, though. One of the more troubling members, Imam Taleb Abdur Rashid, sits on the Mayor's Civic Engagement Committee. Can you tell us a bit more about Rashid? Rashid, um, like a number of these figures, was involved in the scandals involving Islamists back in the day. He has a history of hateful views. Uh, his mosque used the Muslim Brotherhood slogan on its site back in the day, um, which when he became an object of controversy, um, they removed a lot of that, they changed a lot of that. A lot of his ugliness of his views, he defended Ahmadinejad's call for destroying Israel. Um, he's spoken about Islamic terrorism in terms of chickens coming home to roost and all that kind of thing. So um, like a number of the figures that we're going to discuss, he was at once untouchable, kind of controversial figure. You did not want to be associated with him. Now it is very comfortable. It's very, um, there's no problem associating with him. And yes, um, Adam's naming him to the Civic Engagement Committee is definitely, uh, first of all, a problem because it shows that Adams has ties to these groups. Um, Rashid endorsed Adams before this um, as part of a uh, committee of Black Muslim leaders. Um, during this endorsement, he repeatedly attacked America, attacked Israel. Um, he basically defended Adams for even being friendly with Jews. And uh, now, of course, he's uh, Adams is engaging in a struggling act in which he tries to um, keep different people on board. And Rashid is one of them. And Rashid, again, has a history of hateful and extreme views. Uh, despite that, he is very much on board with this party. Another transition team member uh, happened to be a drug dealer before converting to Islam. I'm talking about Umar Abdul Jalil. Uh, can you tell us anything more about Abdul Jalil and his role on the transition committee? So one of the other things that we see, um, that we've seen certainly in New York in the past, is these um, Black Muslim imams who are themselves have come out of the prison system. In many cases, they've been drug dealers. They see Malcolm X as a kind of a model in that regard. Uh, in some cases, they're associated with the Nation of Islam, but more often they've mainstreamed into uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, they themselves um, very much engage in prison dawah. They focus on recruiting people and promoting radical views. You know, as we've seen in Europe, quite a few terrorists have come out of the prison system. Uh, they've been converted there. They've been turned, uh, they've been weaponized there. Uh, so this is another example. This was again, uh, Imam Jalil was a figure who was again, quite controversial back in the day. Bloomberg was forced to cut ties with him um, because he had uh, spewed associated uh, extreme views, including again, suggesting that he was actually recruiting people in prison um, into uh, Islamism, into extreme behavior. Nonetheless, um, again, he is very much back now. And he's one of a number of these figures who are uh, prison imams who seem to be uh, associated with Adams. And if again, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Adams did come out of the NYPD, which means he has ties to assorted people in the correction system as well. And the people he has ties with are not necessarily good law enforcement people. In some cases, like Shilio, they're actually bad people within that system. Sure. So you list a number of other nominees <clears throat> in your article. Um, anyone else in particular that New Yorkers should be concerned about? Well, New Yorkers certainly who were engaged with issues of Islamism in New York probably remember Del, uh, Debbie Almantasser. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people called her Jihad Debbie. She was the key figure in the Khalil Gibran Academy. Uh, who was ousted after uh, promoting these Infatada shirts, uh, Intifada shirts. Uh, as a result, um, there was a pitched battle, was a test of uh, strength and influence for the Islamists. They lost that test, but again, Damian Matasser is now um, part of Eric Adams' transition team, which again is not surprising because she was associated very much with the, um, the Bolasio administration and the Muslim Democratic Club. So uh, this is very much a case of these various groups, these various figures uh, demonstrating that they have staying power, that they're now actually part of the establishment where before there was the ability to oust them, to marginalize them, to play up their role and um, use that scandal to reveal the situation and the agenda. Uh, increasingly now they're very much ensconced and pretty much nobody's talking about it. 
I'm now posting here, but I was, I think, the only person who wrote about this because there's just so little focus, so little attention being paid. There's a lot of attention to various issues like police defunding which, and various quality of life issues. But when it comes to the Islamist infiltration in New York, um, there's so little attention paid to this. The New York Post, which back in the day was very much front and center in reporting on Jaleel, on Del Biel Montaser, uh, has not even covered this. I don't think they're going to. And this is just the reality. Right. I mean, today, the New York Post occasionally writes about Ilhan Omar and very larger issues of national importance, but very, very rarely touches on local Islamist issues and certainly not uh, on the mayor's transition team. Uh, what explains this? Why? This is New York City. This is ground zero of 9-11. Why aren't New Yorkers concerned about uh, what's happening? Well, to the extent that individual New Yorkers are concerned, um, it's people who are very much activists involved in this. And there is unfortunately a smaller number of this. Time has passed since September 11th. Uh, we've had a number of obviously Islamic terrorist attacks in New York City over the years, but there have been fewer of them. There hasn't been a very recent inciting incident that would get people to focus on this. But I think the larger issue is that, as I've mentioned, the various Islamists have uh, become entrenched in the power structure. Demographic change has happened. Uh, the fact that in the past, mayors at least attempted to distance themselves from these groups and now are not even considering doing that uh, is very much due to the political demographics of it. Uh, the growing Muslim population is a powerful political block the way that it's been in Michigan, the way that it's becoming in various parts of the country. Uh, this is unfortunately the reality of political change, which means increasingly papers like New York Post that are very much focused on circulation are more hesitant to do anything uh, over at home. They can attack Elon Omar because attacking Elon Omar is not going to do anything to their newspaper sales, to their circulation. It's not going to get them in trouble in New York City, uh, whereas actually focusing on people associated with the Muslim Democratic Club is now actually politically dangerous. So in many ways, people have accepted this. We've seen this even nationally. They've reconciled themselves. It's the difference between how care was perceived 10, 15 years ago and how it's perceived now. Uh, a lot of people, including people who were formerly conservative, people who were formerly engaged on counter jihad issues have made peace on this. They've reconciled themselves with this. And, you know, we are very much sweepwalking into a major crisis because we've done that. Sure. I, what do you expect? You, see, you mentioned a major crisis. What do you think the result of this is going to be of, of having a transition in, in, uh, in an administration uh, which is populated by so many Islamists? So any, certainly anyone who was expecting that Eric Adams' administration would mean a shift away uh, from the kinds of positions that the DeVos administration took, uh, the suppression of, I mean, the NYPD once, in the, once upon a time was the gold standard for the police um, surveillance for counterterrorism operations. They were quite good. They were in some ways better than the FBI was. Under the Blasio, that has been unfortunately very much trashed. I know people who were part of the NYPD's intelligence operation who are who left, who went anywhere else but there because life was just unworkable there. The NYPD is not allowed to do the kind of serious terrorism prevention that it was able to do in the past. Uh, because again, the political or association was very much associated with people, whom some of whom I mentioned, others who were part of the Blasio administration. Uh, the signal here is these people are going to be part and they're going to be engaged with the Adams administration, which means expecting the NYPD to be empowered to do anything about terrorism um, is very much unlikely unless there is actually a major attack, in which case Adams may temporarily pivot. Uh, but the fact that these people are in his inner circle suggests that the pivot is not going to be significant. It's not going to be lasting. It's not going to endure. Uh, beyond that, obviously, we are increasingly moving to a European kind of situation where mm -hmm. there is a growing population that is uh, the harbors uh, violence and at the same time is very politically involved, politically engaged. Um, there were in the past various um, Muslim uh, groups that were set up to be moderate. Uh, those groups have very much been marginalized. Those people are not showing up in the transition team. Uh, the people who are showing up are the people who are tied to the Muslim Brotherhood, to various Islamists, which means, again, that going forward, these are the people who are going to be representing Muslims in New York. They're going to be setting policy. And obviously, just having them, uh, giving them the ability to set policy in New York means that they're going to have influence nationally uh, because politicians who are uh, in New York State, uh, very much turned to New York City. And, and nationally, while New York is not that significant in presidential elections, it plays a major role in finance. And a lot of the Democrat leadership, some of the Republican leadership actually come through there. So this is a trend, something uh, that New York is going to pioneer <clears throat> and the rest of the country is going to experience in coming years as the Islamist population, certainly the Muslim population grows in this country. 
Now, a good way to look at it is that we were what we were seeing in Michigan in terms of Islamist influence is now New York, um, and that's going to continue onward. It's going to continue. Uh, New York took longer uh, to gain a foothold on just because of its complexity, its diversity, its sheer huge population. But uh, gaining that kind of center of influence is significant, and it shows that other centers of influence will follow. Well, where will those centers of influence, to the to the best of your estimate, be in America? Where where's the next Islamist hotspot? Well, we're certainly going to see. We are seeing plenty of activity in um, the Bay Area and Los Angeles, um, but it's not the same level of power and influence that we're actually now seeing in New York City. But it, it is developing, and I think we're going to see that more and more. Uh, especially as we see the next wave of migration coming out of Afghanistan. We've seen this in the past where there is a crisis. Uh, there's an influx of population. Uh, we saw that with Somalis. Uh, we're going to begin seeing that with Syrians. We're going to see this with Afghans in the future. Uh, once you actually create this crisis, you use it to um, explore demographic change, and then you can create this new generation of political leaders who now have a great deal of influence. Now, in New York City, a number of these people are um, Black Muslims who have come through the prison system, but they're also Palestinians, there are Syrians, there are Egyptians. Um, they're all playing a significant role in New York City politics. There are sizable now Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities. So we are going to see um, political change as a result of that. Now, political change will basically cripple counterterrorism. It will lead to um, violence, particularly anti-Semitic violence, as part of the process. Mm. Yeah, I mean, New York is it stands out because many other communities across the country, like Chicago, it's known for its little Palestine. Uh, you have a strong Yemeni and Bangladeshi community uh, in Dearborn and Hamtramck, Michigan. Uh, you have a Somali community, of course, in Minneapolis and Columbus, Ohio. Uh, New York, though, uh, is just a hodgepodge of Islamists from all over the world, bringing all of their value systems with them. Um, is that a unique challenge that New York faces, uh, having so many different national ethnic identities there? So in the past, as you've said, um, a lot of the targets for Islamist migration was these post-industrial areas. Um, in America, it's the Rust Belt. In the mm. UK, you have places like Manchester, people, uh, cities that had an industrial base and then became economically depressed. Those were very easy to take over. That's why Michigan was a major starting point back in the day. Uh, they were very useful. Um, taking over major cities that are more thriving, more vibrant, more diverse, more heavily populated is much more of a challenge. And with New York City, we're seeing that they are able to do that just as they were able to exercise a good deal of influence in London. I think London is actually a very good model for what's happening in New York City. Um, I think within the next decade, we will probably see a Muslim mayor and he will very probably be tied to various Islamist groups, uh, which will itself be a sea change. So where are the pockets of Islamist influence in New York City itself? I know there's Sunset Park, Bay Ridge, um, anywhere else that you're aware of where there seems to be a strong Islamist presence? So those are definitely some areas. Uh, there are parts of Brooklyn that just have dotted Muslim communities. They don't necessarily always have easy neighborhood designations, but anybody who's walking around places um, will actually be able to spot them pretty easily because you're just walking around and you're seeing bits of old Brooklyn, then you see mosques, you see particular Bangladeshi communities popping up around McDonald Avenue in exactly this sort of way. And New York City is an interesting hodgepodge because you have a lot of these uh, really small um, ethnic communities that are set up that maybe run four, five, six, eight blocks and then give way to something else, which makes this challenging. So what they've done very effectively here uh, is join these multicultural coalitions that seemingly on paper have a, a very little in common that may actually be hostile. So you have, for example, Eric Adams using um, the various Islamic communities and Hasidic groups who, uh, Hasidic Jewish groups who live side by side, and he gained both of their support. So savvy politicians can do this, they can juggle this. How well they'll be able to juggle this when you have an increase in violence? Um, in terrorism is you know, yet to be determined, but the bottom line is this is key to gaining, to gaining political power in places that are very heavily diverse. You create this coalition. Those politicians who do it successfully, uh, they have to appease Islamist organizations. They have to go to these mosques. They have to play up to them. And you know, we've seen this very much happen in Democrat politics, but you know, in neighboring New Jersey, uh, we saw Chris Christie do this very much in Republican politics. So you know, this is not just a single party issue. A lot of people focus on the Democrats. Yes, it's a problem for Democrats, but the Bush administration, um, the Christie administration locally, uh, very much an issue. Uh, the Perry administration in Texas. 
Uh, Texas is a very much under discussed issue as far as the growth of the Islamic population goes and their political influence, but I think this is something that is going to be a critical issue uh, going forward. Sure, so shifting focus briefly uh, before we move on to our audience questions. Uh, Adams' ties to Islamists didn't begin, of course, with his election to mayor. Uh, he's been known to be in bed with Turkey's ruling Justice and Development Party, or the AKP. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so as I began earlier, uh, the um, really these, this entanglement very much is connected to Eric Adams' role as Brooklyn Borough President. To get the Brooklyn Borough President, he had to form these Islamist alliances. Um, he had to form alliances with those a variety of groups. One of those was the Turkish community, which is on paper a very strange alliance. The Turkish community in New York is there, but it's not that huge. But at the same time, he's gotten uh, money financing from Turkish businessmen. They've held fundraisers for him. Some of those businessmen have ties to um, the Erdogan regime uh, in Turkey. Uh, the Turkish regime has paid for him to come to Turkey a number of times on tours. Uh, he's talked up Turkey quite a bit. This actually offended the um, Greek community in, Amer in uh, New York. The Armenian community has not been very happy with this. But at the same time, he decided that he was going to um, sacrifice the Greek and Armenian votes. I think there are actually more of them than there are Turkish than there are Turkish voters in New York City in order to play up to them. So there is obviously money coming there. There is support coming there, which again means that he is entangled on a deeper level than just asking for these people's votes. He's asking for their money. He's gotten money from them at crucial times, which means they actually are going to be power players in politics. It also means that the Turkish regime is going to have a good deal of influence there whenever they want it. All right, um, this brings an end to our one-on-one -on -one discussion. I'm gonna move on to our audience questions. I thank everyone for their participation. Uh, please uh, do ask more questions if you like in the following uh, eight minutes or so before we come to an end. Um, our first question comes from Neil Feldman. It's sort of an observation of his and I'm not quite sure what, what question he's asking, but he, he uh, he observes the extraordinary size of Eric Adams' transition team, about 700 members. Um, is that an, an outstanding number? Is that usual, uh, to your knowledge, in, in mayoral politics? It's overkill, but again, Eric Adams' thing has been to build a vast coalition, just invite everybody to come to the party. Uh, mm -hmm. When you do that, of course, you end up with a lot of problematic people in the mix. Uh, but this has been his strategy. His strategy has been to get as many of these little uh, niche groups uh, with him as much as possible. And the transition team reflects that everybody <laughs> gets a seat at the table. Sure. And to be clear, this is an interim government of sorts to help Adams uh, select his administration moving forward, right? Yes. But it means these are the people who have a say, they have a seat at the table. It means these are the people he's uh, going to actually, who are going to be potentially players in this administration. These are the people who supported him. Now, these are the people who actually um, get to play. Sure. Jay Lewis asks, and I believe he's referring to the trend of uh, Islamists moving to uh, uh, different cities across America and setting up political power centers. He asks, can this trend be stopped? And if so, how? Well, again, this is a very much an immigration issue. And uh, the basic reality is that we're facing a demographic crisis because of an immigration policy that is very much targeted uh, Muslim countries. Uh, during the Obama administration, for the first time, you had actually more Muslim refugees coming in than Christian refugees. The Biden administration's decision to rapidly accelerate um, the transportation of Afghans, for example, a uh, program that would normally take uh, two to five years to resettle this population that they plan to do in 30 days. Obviously, vetting has been tossed aside. And this is also part of the larger dynamic here, which is that um, these crises in the Muslim world, very often involving terrorism, often involving jihadist groups, are used to bring this population to America, where the crisis repeats itself this time in the United States. This is how we got here. Uh, if you want to understand, for example, where September 11th came from, where so many of these uh, terror plots are coming from it's because we are importing the terrorist problems, the civil and religious conflicts of the Muslim world into America. So, you know, we need to rethink immigration. If we don't do that, uh, we're going to go the way of Europe. Europe has given us a pretty clear example of what happens when you just have an open door policy. And, you know, we're seeing this for ourselves. Thank you, Daniel, for, for your answer. Our next question comes from Len, who makes a great point. 
He notes that Eric Adams was supported by the Jewish community. Do you think his ties to the Islamists will influence him to move away from the Jewish community? Well, you know, the Jewish community is um, kind of a big category, even if it doesn't seem that way. Eric Adams was supported by Hasidic and very religious Jews who were looking for relief from the crime wave under the Blasio administration, and they did not want any of the police defunding progressives backed, for example, by AOC to get in. Um, the what people think of as a Jewish community when it comes to a more liberal and secular community very much was backing those uh, progressives. Now, um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but um, the Orthodox community in New York has largely been uh, broken up into districts where they can't elect their own people as part of a larger gerrymandering strategy, which means their options are in practice somewhat limited. Um, I wouldn't want to be a community leader having to make the decision between Islamists and uh, people shooting up your homes. It's not a good decision either way. And it's a tribute to New York's completely dysfunctional politics that people have to make these kinds of decisions. Great. Our next question comes from Taffy Gold, who asks, have things changed consider considerably since Steve Emerson did Jihad in America, which I believe she's referring to his PBS uh, documentary, Jihad in America? Well, I mean, you could at this very simple level point out that no such documentary would ever run on PBS. Mm. But yes, things have changed. Uh, they've changed for, for the worse. Everything that Steve Emerson that others predicted that um, Daniel Pipes has talked about, that so many of the pioneers have talked about, uh, is very much in place. It is very much a reality. What we're describing is a situation where it is actually in place, but hardly anybody is even talking about it. Thank you. We have another question uh, from a Stuart V. What is the estimated Muslim population of New York City? Also, how fast is it growing? Thank you, Mr. Green, Greenfield, for this enlightening presentation. Well, as you know quite well, you have different estimates. Uh, the various Islamist groups will radically overestimate their population. It's hard to know. So it can be more useful, for example, to count mosques. There are over 100 mosques in Brooklyn. Uh, the exact size of the Muslim population, um, you get a uh, you get various um, estimates from public policy agencies, and you get Islamist estimates, which tend to be way overkill. Uh, but the sort of uh, real way to look at things is to, for example, examine the um, under 20 population, the under 10 population, the under five population. Now, one significant data point, uh, this is something that Islamist groups achieved under the Blasi administration, was they got halal meals in public schools, in New York City public schools. You don't, I believe, have uh, kosher, uh, certainly not glad kosher meals in public schools. So you have a very significant um, population of Muslim children in New York City public schools. Um, and this is really where the demographic growth is coming from. So it's often illusory to look at the overall population. Is, are there 50,000, 20,000, 10,000? If you look at the size of the, of the underage population, the under 10 population in particular, you're seeing where the real growth is coming from, which is why noting, for example, how popular a name Muhammad is tells us far more than the overall demographic picture. Thank you. Uh, another question from Neil Feldman here, who wants to know um, how much influence Islamists may have had on New York City progressives' belief that there's too much traditional law and order and strong policing. Uh, how may have they uh, influenced Eric Adams to step back on, on policing and law and order issues? So the Islamist groups uh, very aptly formed effective coalitions. This is something that really uh, highlighted their transition from being kind of marginalized to being at the center of politics. They dug their way deep into this intersectional coalition. Uh, mm -hmm. When the Black Lives Matter riots were going on, uh, when various uh, opposition to police was going on, they very effectively formed these coalitions. And they had a good reason for doing that because NYPD surveillance of mosques was one of their big targets. They were going after it and they understood that if they formed alliances with so-called criminal justice reformers, uh, with various black nationalists that were also anti-police, they could very effectively get their agenda forward. So they were in on the ground floor. Uh, they've pushed this very aggressively. They've adopted the language of the so-called social justice movements uh, in opposing police, but they oppose it obviously for their own reasons, which is that they don't want surveillance of terrorist groups and uh, terrorist plotters happening particularly. They don't want those attacks to be tied to mosques, which is what the NYPD was doing very effectively. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that's about all the time we have. I'd like to thank our guest, Mr. Daniel Greenfield, for his excellent article and for answering our questions today. Stay su subscribed to our email newsletters and social media at the Middle East Forum and Islamist Watch. And then tune in next Friday at the same time for another 
webinar with the forum's project directors. Thank you. Thank you for watching and goodbye.